Let's talk to Nigerian Army General, military strategist, former Provost Marshal of uh, the Nigerian Army, talking about Major General Pat Akem. He joins us uh, from our Abuja studios. Uh, good morning, General. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lady. Thanks for having me here. The situation is uh, becoming uh, more and more uh, complicated, shall we say. Uh, you, you probably heard the the U.S. Uh, Director of uh, National Intelligence and uh, uh, the Director of Military Intelligence saying there that uh, the Russians can't win, the Ukrainians can't win. It's like a, a kind of a military stalemate. Uh, what do you do militarily as a strategist when you're in that kind of situation? Okay, thanks. Um, what we're having right now appears to be a battle of attrition, and it will go on for a while. Um, this war is going to be won and lost on the back of logistics. And I recall that General Omar Bradley, one of the few generals to reach five stars in the U.S. Army, once said, and, and I quote, amateurs discuss strategy, professionals talk uh, logistics. Um, with the logistics continue to be flowing to Ukraine, it looks uh, on present evidence to be so. Uh, the signing of the Land Lease Act by Biden will facilitate continuous flow of logistics quickly, like it was done during the uh, Second World War before America joined the war. Uh, so logistics will keep flowing in. Will Russia continue to sustain its firing of even hypersonic missiles that are very expensive, would they continue to fire and destroy uh, cities, infrastructure, and perhaps break the economy of um, Ukraine? Where, based on the number of uh, sanctions that have been imposed and is, uh, the effect they are going to have going forward, uh, if it continues like this, there will be a stalemate. So this, this war uh, that has been punctuated by log logistic hiccups, um, Poor planning on the part of Russia uh, who appears to have entered into the, first, the level of attrition where no one is winning, so to speak. Because even in Kharkiv, where you mentioned, uh, uh, Ukraine has taken, taken back some of the, the areas that were captured. But Russia is a, a, it's a big military power. Uh, and with a population of uh, 145 million people, uh, is able to draw, at least from the human perspective, draw a lot of uh, troops anytime it wants. Uh, whether they will continue to produce the logistics required, some of well, the components will be required to come from outside. So I don't know. Uh, but on current evidence, battle of attrition, and of course the way to fight, and the Ukrainians have the way to fight. Um, they fear that the, this war was unprovoked. They fear that the, it shouldn't have happened. And uh, I mean, the other day I had a, a woman, an old woman of 80 years old, saying, if I, if I get Putin, I will tear him apart. So when the anger gets to that boiling point, it means that we just keep fighting until the last man. Given that scenario, though, uh, because you seem to agree that it's a war of attrition and nobody really is winning. Uh, so it will probably take the point you mentioned, which is the issue of logistics and who can probably draw on the better logistics. The Ukrainians have the support of the West. The Russians have the armaments and the people. Uh, so it's who is going to be able to put this uh, uh, together faster and more efficiently. But in terms of what is going on, even in surrounding areas, I mean, because this is not only about Russia and Ukraine, all the other countries in the surrounding area are also revising their strategies. Uh, you talk, you're talking about Finland uh, and Denmark, for example, reconsidering. Sweden. What, yeah, uh, Sweden rather uh, they're trying to reconsider whether or not they should join NATO. In fact, I believe that sometime this week, either today or at the end of this week, one of them is actually going to make that decision about whether or not to join yeah. or to seek to join. Yeah. So, in terms of that broader picture, is that also going to, do you think, play a role? in what and how this situation, this military stalemate within Ukraine ultimately ends. Do you think so? Yeah, you see, some of the strategic imperatives that uh, provoke this war have been found to be miscalculations. And, and, and they're forced to reason because, you see, uh, one time Mike Tyson made a statement that appears to be very true today. 
He said everybody has a plan until they are hitting them out. So there was a plan. The plan was capture Ukraine, destroy its, its army, install a new government, remove uh, Zelensky, install a new government that will be pliant to the wishes of Russia. And then the, the overarching uh, goal was to, to, to just divide NATO and make them virtually ineffective. The contrary has happened. Nations have become afraid, looking at the, the brutal nature of the war going on now. The destruction of the destructions of villages, towns, cities, uh, the, 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 the sheer volume of force that has been leased or, or unleashed on a nation that is smaller in stature uh, has made other nations to sit back and take a second look at what their security imperatives are. Uh, so Finland is moving closer and closer, and like you said this week, they, they are likely to to submit the application to join NATO. Um, NATO has become even stronger. If you look at the number of visits by high-profile leaders uh, to Ukraine, even in the face of the danger uh, that they face, um, shows that NATO is uh, binding and becoming stronger and stronger. Uh, of course, America has entered into this uh, and is likely to, to stay the course. So. Um, the, the desired outcomes have appear not to have been met, so to speak, um, and uh, it will continue. I, I, I mean, because even France now is is carrying out exercises and retraining and recalibrating to see uh, yeah. because the posture has changed. So basically, uh, you are right. Uh, nations are sitting on edge, and they will continue to bind together as a collective to serve as a counterweight to what uh, Putin may do in the future. But I, I will consider that Putin is a smart person. Uh, you can't rule a nation for 22 years without a nation of 145 million people for 22 years without some certain level of strategic thinking. So I think that Putin too will re recalibrate and I mean, I mean come up with some things. If he sees, even though the general agreement is, uh, the general summation is that it will be a prolonged war, but if Putin sees something that he can take away as a, as a token of victory, then they may negotiate. And especially if he holds the, the Donbass region, um, he, that may become a very good leverage to, to negotiate upon. You were provost marshal of uh, the Nigerian army and therefore in a very good position uh, to talk about what, what I want to mention next, which is the issue of discipline. Uh, within uh, the armed forces. I mean, everybody takes it for, uh, for granted that uh, within, the, uh, within the armed forces, discipline is the watchword. Uh, but there are times of, uh, uh, there are times in war when discipline is the difference between success and failure. Uh, and then, of course, the manner Very of putting so. together, yes, the manner of putting together uh, the forces uh, that you are fighting with uh, also tends to have impact on, on the discipline. When you put the Ukrainian forces and the Russian forces uh, on a scale. Uh, so far, 11 weeks down the line, who do you see uh, uh, on balance as having put together what is necessary in terms of discipline? On current evidence and from what we are seeing, the Ukrainians appear to be more disciplined. Um, it looks like the Russian forces, even though Russia is a, is a big military power, um, but you know, the kind of battles you fight will also determine the kind of discipline you have. If you are having the kind of enemy where you bomb and reduce them to, to nothing and then you, you do not need to really occupy the ground and, and do things, then again, if you, do, if, if, if you were not involved in that for a, a long while, then the level of discipline you bring to the table will be different. Uh, so on current evidence from what we have seen from intercepts, uh, communicating on open lines, uh, sabotaging um, um, fighting equipment, um, virtually disobeying orders, normally, normally you don't have that in professional, highly professional armed forces. Uh, so it appeared that some young guys who were thrust into battle, who had not seen combat before, are not doing things that they should be are, are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, of course, the, the, the Ukrainians have an impetus and a motivation to fight. Like I said, they keep feeling that this was an unprovoked war and that this is their land. Um, they have more at stake than the Russians. They have uh, the Russians have a little bit of luxury. 
Uh, but the Ukrainians have no 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 able room to within which to say oh we will not we will not be disciplined we will, we will misbehave. So yeah, on current evidence, discipline on, on current evidence the, the Ukrainians and discipline has a lot to do with whether you win or lose a lose a war. Uh, but again, Russia is a massive force. They can draw from resources continually. Um, so when it becomes a prolonged battle of attrition for a long haul, we the Ukrainians keep getting the support they are getting. If governments change within NATO, will they still get the support they are getting? So uh, basically, uh, the, 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 the jury is yet uh, is out, uh, has not come in. There are people who talk about uh, leverage here and, and, and a balance of forces which then enables uh, peace to be discussed. Uh, one of my previous guests had said that, look, that for both parties to consider peace viable, uh, there needs to be some kind of military equilibrium. You were uh, former commander of Operation Safe Haven, and in that role, uh, you were also uh, saddled with uh, the issue of peace. Uh, and so I want to ask, do you think that the situation, as you've, had, as you've seen it, on the ground in, in Ukraine right now, I mean, if you were a military if, uh, a commander on the ground in Ukraine, do you think on either side now, uh, it would be good to consider peace. Look, the Ukrainians are open to peace. The level of destruction, the economy has contracted 30%. Um, Fuel is on is scarce now. Uh, grains are sitting in silos instead of being exported. So Ukraine is suffering a lot. Without the help that is coming from outside, the nation would have collapsed. So the Ukrainian Zelensky will tell you firsthand that he wants he wants peace. He wants to negotiate. The only clog in the in the in the wheel towards uh, negotiation is the fact that Ukraine feels that this was an unprovoked war. It's a land grab, and that no territory of theirs will be seized by Russia or considered. So that that is the only reason why there may be no negotiation. But again, I'm thinking that uh, President Putin. Uh, we also look for a way to negotiate if the imperatives, if the if the picture on the ground appears favorable, uh, and if he can save face, if he can say yes, we've gotten something tangible. Um, so yeah, the options are very open for peace, uh, for negotiation, for peace, and uh, the Ukrainians even more so. Uh, they want they want peace because the economy is being destroyed, um, the country is the country is suffering. One hundred about 15 million people displaced. Five million migrants in Europe. Uh, they, no, no peace. Beautiful cities reduced to rubble. So Ukrainians have more, more, more motiv motivation, more motives to, to, to negotiate. But Russia will also want to get something tangible to show that, look, uh, we went into war and we're coming away with this. And that is why the Donbass region is very critical. Uh, and they've taken virtually 80% of it, uh, unknown to many. 80% of the land. And then, of course, they are now, they are now putting pressure on, on Ukraine, uh, firing, firing uh, hypersonic missiles into Odessa, the only port that appears to be viable now. Uh, once that is shut down, it's virtually even the aid coming from outside the Ukraine will become threatened. So, yeah, there, are, there, is, there is a lot of room for negotiation and, and um, a lot of motivation to negotiate. There's a lot, I, I, uh, I would like to say that it would be yes. good if, if America... And, and NATO kind of push Putin towards saving face so that he can, he can go away with something uh, to show that, yes, because the suffering is too much. Mm. A lot there to chew. Uh, uh, Major General Pat Akem, uh, thank you so much uh, for your perspective this morning. Uh, it was nice to speak to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, ladies. It's a, pre a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much.